I want to introduce you to James Reinders from Intel, and sincerely thanks, James, for coming. And uh, I believe that it's a unique opportunity to hear how a major company as Intel did a step of open sourcing one product. And I think that the future, it's a convergence between what once was called proprietary software and the open source. So please, James, all yours. Thank you. So good morning. My name's James Reinders. I work out of the uh, Portland, Oregon office of Intel, where I've had the pleasure to work um, at Intel for uh, almost 21 years now. I thought, <clears throat> I, I tell people I, I went to Intel thinking it would be a fun place to work for a few years, little company that not many people had heard of, and uh, somehow I kind of got stuck there. Um, I've spent my time working on parallelism um, almost exclusively for those two decades in one form or another, so it's a real passion of mine. Um, it started out as a passion for big iron, uh, supercomputers. Um, I helped uh, design, I was one of the architects on the first teraflop machine called ASCII Red. Um, as, I, <clears throat> as I well know now, uh, a teraflop won't even get you on the top 500 com uh, computers in the world, but at one time it was the fastest computer in the world for um, somewhere around three years. So, so I know parallelism. Somewhere around five years ago, though, parallelism came to us in a different form as we moved to multi-core processors, and I've been spending my time uh, looking at how we can help with that. And I also have the good fortune, I, I work for a group that produces tools and mostly sells them, although we make our uh, Linux tools available for non-commercial use for free. And I sit not too far from a group of um, people that um, are complete um, converts to open source and think that anything other than open source is evil, and I get to spend time with them. I'm a little bit more uh, versatile in thinking. Um, I really enjoy open source a great deal. Uh, I finally, uh, with some help from my daughter, wiped out all the Windows machines in our house. Um, it's completely Linux-oriented or Mac. Um, so I do have some personal bias there, but I get to work with both. Um, what I want to talk about today is there's a project called uh, Threading Building Blocks, <clears throat> which I got involved with a while ago. I got so involved with that I helped convince Intel <clears throat> to open source it instead of keeping it proprietary. And um, I wrote a book about it, an O'Reilly Nutshell book um, on threading building blocks. Um, so something that started as a little bit of an interest, hey, that looks like an interesting project I got pretty involved with. So I want to give you an appreciation for three things as I talk today. One is threading building blocks itself, which you may not have heard of before. Um, give you some perspective on it. Um, another one is I, I will back up and talk about parallelism a little bit um, from my viewpoint about why um, we're doing it. Um, I won't spend very much time on that, but I thought I should say a few things about it, um, how I see it, how uh, I would think um, Intel sees um, the future with parallelism. And then, you know, is threading building blocks enough? Are there other parallelism models and what role might open source have? I'll try to motivate and structure a little bit um, why there's different pro programming models necessary for parallelism and what we might do with that. And I won't talk about how to teach parallelism. Um, somehow I, I got really lucky and also got the last slot of the day. And I'll talk a little bit about experiences teaching parallelism right before the panel um, this afternoon. Hope to see some of you again then, or all of you. So parallel hardware is pretty much everywhere today. Um, some exceptions might be some netbooks, but is there a question? What was the second one? Uh, okay, so um, the question is, do I see, uh, do I classify parallelism, um, think of it as Nehalem style where every, um, every uh, core has symmetric or has access to the same memory, shared memory, or whether it's a more distributed model that we may see. Um, I think there'll be both. I think that the, um, the expose showing a shared memory model, at least faking it, a combination between hardware and software, 
is going to be much more popular, higher volume than any um, distributed memory solutions on a chip. Um, that said, I think there is going to be applications for the distributed memory. I think um, my talk today is going to focus pretty strongly on the challenges of, of a shared memory programming model. <clears throat> I carefully say shared memory programming model because the thing that really um, limits parallel programs from being effective at scaling is uh, shared mutable state, sharing state. And um, the speaker before me said, well, Erlang has this goal, um, or at least says you share nothing. And the reason is, is that if you can get to writing a parallel program where you share nothing, uh, you have a much better chance that it will be an effective parallel program. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, as software gets more comfortable with that, we'll be able to do less of that in hardware. But I think to sell hardware in high volume, it needs to expose a shared memory model. So I expect we'll see m much more m um, things like Nehalem than we will um, uh, other solutions. Now that said, we, we build what people will buy. Um, <laughs> some, some people like to think that Intel, you know, we have to buy what Intel makes. Uh, I, I, working in Intel, know that that's not true. Customers buy what customers think they can make the best use of. And there's rigorous debate in Intel about what that will be as we add cores in the future. Um, on the low end, like with Atom processors and low power devices, adding more cores will probably go much slower than on servers because of the preference for low power. Although we always, as software developers and users, want to put more and more on every device. So I'm pretty sure multi-core on Atom will be a reality uh, in the upcoming years. But we did a big shift. About five years ago, we introduced the first multi-core processor from Intel, um, the first multi-core uh, x86 processor. And um, the reason was because that was the thing that we thought we could sell with the more transistors. So every 18 months or so, we can put twice as many transistors in the same area. Um, in fact, I saw something very funny the other day. It was how big a Nehalem chip or one of our current processors would be if it was done on the, on the uh, technology of a 386. And it was something like this big. I can give you a perspective. And it was just reverse math, you know, double the size um, going backwards. Um, but what do you do with those extra transistors? Well, in the past, what we had been doing is um, increasing the clock rate. And every time you double a clock rate, a processor, a device is going to consume four times as much power because the power increases roughly the square of the clock rate. Now, forgive me, I am an engineer. I know that's not quite true, but it's close enough. Back of the envelope math. And, and what we had been doing to cheat that a bit was every 18 months we could have the size of a, a given design. And having the area roughly halves the power. So what we would do is double the performance by doubling the clock. And that quadruples the power, but we would shrink it to half its size. So we could give you a chip every 18 months or so that was twice the performance and it consumed twice as much power. It seemed like a fair deal. But at some point, that doesn't work out so well. There's only so many batteries you can cram in a laptop or how many pounds you can lug on an airplane. And even server farms were spending as much on the cooling systems as they were on the compute systems. And, um, and they were working with the power companies to get uh, uh, local um, servers or um, substations put in for electricity. In fact, Google put a, 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 or put a big server farm about 100 miles from where I live, and what they did is they bought an old aluminum smelting plant that still had the contracts for electricity. You know, the, the, they, and they use all the power that an aluminum smelting plant used to use to smelt aluminum, which is pretty electrically intensive, to power a new server farm. So customers like Google and so forth, even with the high-end, are telling us, stop doing this. So um, that's often called the power wall. So stop making processors consume more and more power, even if you can give me more performance. But there's also a couple others. Memory speeds don't get faster, and the faster the processor gets relative to the memory, the less useful it is. I mean, a lot of applications are limited by the speed that they can fetch things from memory. Um, now, we're really good at making really big caches and trying to hide that, and for some programs that works really well. Um, it doesn't work well enough in general 
to keep doing that. And so there's a, an issue with speeding up processors relative to memory. And then there's also instruction level parallelism. As we speed it up, we're adding more circuits, looking for more things to do in parallel, automatically instructions in the single stream. And that, that was petering out. So yeah, we could make a processor run twice as fast, but the performance was tapering off and the power was killing us. So it's really three things that came together, these three things. And some people have summed it up calling this the brick wall when you combine the three of these. So multi-core is there as an option. There are actually some other options. One is just make the processor smaller and lower power. We're going to see that. And the other is to start playing with what the cores look like. And I actually think that's an interesting future as well. We'll bring graphics on board with our, um, we'll bring graphical processing onto the die, probably not increase the cores as much, and then you can play with the graphics. So anyways, there's a lot of things going on. But a key thing to remember is, um, Multicore is here to stay, and we're going to keep being able to double the number of transistors in the same area about every 18 months, which means the processors are going to be able to get more and more sophisticated. Now, can the software take advantage of it, or how will it take advantage of it? When we get this extra performance, one thing I've found to be true my entire career <laughs> is software shows up to take advantage of it. Um, so, you know, there are people who say, wow, if you build these faster chips, will anyone use them? What? Yeah. <laughs> Twice as long to work. Yeah, it, 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 there is time. Um, there's another saying that's very popular. Intel is, uh, or in the, some people in the industry is uh, what, uh, well, it's back in the days of Andy Grove and, and uh, uh, Bill Gates, but it's uh, what Andy giveth, Bill taketh away. Um, <laughs> so. Anyways, wait, did we tape that? Um, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, you know, some people will say, are we actually going to use this? Um, I'm confident we will. Your comment's well taken that it may take a while to debug it and sort it out. And um, yes, that makes, uh, you know, honestly, it makes us nervous at Intel sometimes, too. You, you don't want to get ahead of the curve. If you start trying to build processors that people won't buy, um, and they, you go down in the history books as being ahead of your time, that's not good, because I like drawing a salary and stuff. It helped pay for the plane ticket here. Um, so, so how should we write parallel programs? So we got looking at this, and I'm very passionate about programming models and what works and doesn't work. And, um, and a key thing is the level of abstraction. So today, when you talk about parallel programming, quickly people talk about threads and locks. You talk about p threads and mutexes. Um, on Linux. On Windows, you talk about Windows threads and critical sections. Um, this is pretty low-level stuff, particularly threads, because a thread, what I mean by a thread here is a thread of software execution, and you're trying to match it up with a thread of hardware execution. Now today, it used to be the thread of hardware execution was each processor had one, could execute one thing at a time. With multi-core, you most of the cores can do one thing at a time. Some of our processors have um, threaded cores, and they can actually do multiple things. So you might have a four core that can do eight hardware threads. But as a programmer, you should not be writing a program saying, gee, I'm going to run on eight cores. Or maybe at runtime, say, how many cores are there? Oh, there's eight. I'm going to split my work up on eight. You should not be doing that. You're, you're going to really lose badly if you do that. First of all, it's a royal headache. You fork off four threads because you're on four cores. And then one of the threads discovers more work to do. Now, how, how, do you want to load balance that, or do you just want to suck it up on that core? Um, if you load balance it, how do you communicate to the other thread saying, hey, would you help me out here? Um, nested parallelism is a nightmare. And to really make it bad is I predict that when, we, um, when Intel produces its first 40 or 50 core processor for volume use, I predict that the cores on that will not be the same. I predict that some of them will be out of order execution engines like we build in Nehalem that can do everything and try to make everything run fast. And a bunch of them will be a lot dumber, like uh, what we call in order executions, like the Pentium processor was. They're much more die efficient. They don't have as much sophisticated circuitry to reorder instructions. Um, but they're not as, they don't have as good a throughput unless you're running programs that know how to take advantage of those. And I think that once you parallel, do a program in parallel, those cores will be useful. 
So let's imagine a 40-core processor and eight cores are big cores and 32 are little cores. If your program wakes up and says, hey, how many cores? Oh, 40 cores. I'll work, divide the work up evenly. And maybe the little cores, the 32 of them, can only do processing at about a third the rate of the big cores. That's in the future. Those definitely will be processors like that. So anyone that's writing code that wakes up and says, how many cores are there, doesn't know how to do load balancing, assumes the cores are the same, gets to rewrite their code again. There's much better ways to do this. Um, for instance, o even OpenMP, and Intel's a big promoter of OpenMP. We were part of the initial specification of it back in 96. Uh, in fact, we were kind of twice because there was another company, but we bought them um, that was really big in it too. And um, so there's a lot of key people that are behind OpenMP that I work with. Um, and you don't talk about how many threads there are there. You just say, hey, I want to run this loop in parallel. It's a good example, not a perfect example, but we've learned some things in the 15 years since. MPI, Erlang, um, CUDA, OpenCL. So MPI, Erlang and OpenMP are, are pretty good. Co-Array, Fortran work is pretty good. But things like CUDA, OpenCL, even MPI threads, these are all way too low level. They're like assembly language. And programs written using threads or CUDA, um, you can make them work. You can apply your expertise. Don't get me wrong. If you go into them, you can make some wonderful things happen, very close to the metal. Um, you could do that with assembly language, too. But an assembly language program written several decades ago is unlikely to compile without change and be useful today. But a program written in C several decades ago is probably going to be pretty effective today. Um, so we're looking for what are the programming models that we could promote and gradually get people using. Like again, the comments about it takes a while to debug and get things working. If we're going to promote something, it ought to be something that will hold up. And that's where um, threading building blocks came in for us. So, you know, we get an abstraction. Oh, absolutely. So there's a comment that something like uh, OpenCL, OpenGL, CUDA, that, that they're um, having those specifications and building on them can be really powerful. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there, that's why I said encouraging them as programming models that a lot of people code to directly, very bad. Having them close to the metal, controlling, very good. Um, in threads, let's face it, um, I'm going to talk about threading building blocks being wonderful and abstracting things to task. Guess what it uses? It calls to pthreads. I mean, you have to have a good pthread specification. It's just, do you teach people about pthreads and say, if you're going to add parallelism, do it in pthreads? No. If you're going to write yourself a package that millions of other people use, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, very good point. But when we write our applications, we should separate ourselves and be looking at abstractions. Um, ideally, the parallelism should be implicit, um, as it is in um, things like Erlang and so forth, where you just write some code and you describe relationships and it just runs in parallel. If it is explicit, it should be at a task level, not a thread level. So you sh <laughs> one way I put this is if your program ever tries to figure out how many cores you're running on, you're probably making a mistake. If, you, if your application, I'm talking again high-level application, if you've written a runtime, yeah, it's going to be querying how many cores and doing adjustments and so forth. So we have OpenMP from Intel um, and from many vendors. So this was an open API approach, an open standard approach, where every vendor went out and implemented OpenMP. Um, GNU and Microsoft finally implemented this more than a decade after the specification came out. And finally, you could say that virtually every compiler has it. So OpenMP is a pretty safe thing to code in. It's supported pretty well. Implementations vary in their efficiency, but um, it's there. And we're, we're going to continue supporting it at Intel. In fact, we believe we have the best implementation performance-wise. Um, and I think we can, we can show that. But that's OK. There's very good implementations out there. And then MPI. MPI is not. It's a great standard. It's not much of an abstraction, um, but it's a heavily used in supercomputing. So these are two really important methods. Neither of them would I advocate. If you're, if you're looking at how am I going to use my quad core, 
I wouldn't suggest looking at either of these. So, threading building blocks, what is it? C++ was not designed, neither was C, for parallelism. So it has problems. And so we took a look at that and said, what are the problems? How can we fix them? And we came up with solutions um, for them. And this is what, open, uh, what uh, threading building blocks, um, what I can say about it today. It solves the challenges of C++ moving to parallelism and, and C. Um, it's portable. It should work with any compiler. It's been ported to, on top of many compilers and Tune, um, many operating systems, many different processors. Um, and I politely say here it's coordinated with efforts by Microsoft to imitate it and take it proprietary. Um, that's being polite. Um, Microsoft chose not to use this, which um, I'm still not the happiest person in the world about it, but um, we've got a level of coordination there I think will work with programmers. Um, but we made a decision to try to open this up and help the open source community be a driver in parallelism and um, from an open source perspective, um, attempts to imitate open source or to take pieces of it, the best of it, make it proprietary and drive it into a community that may not know the open source alternative exists um, could be a threat to open source leading the way here. So I put the word flattered. Maybe I should be flattered because imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but um, I would have actually preferred if they endorsed a, a standard. But okay, I can dream. Um, so we've got threading building blocks there, and, and this, is, this is kind of a quick diagram. This is the tutorial of threading building blocks before I talk a little bit about what the future might be in other models. Here's what we did with threading building blocks. The first thing you think of, a lot of people think of for parallelism is how do I do a parallel for? How do I do a parallel while, a sort, so forth? So we've got algorithms to do that. Those are wonderful. That's what um, a lot of people are attracted to threading building blocks on because, hey, I'm going to do a parallel for. I, I, that my program will suddenly work in parallel. It's great. But there's some other problems with C. One is STL is not thread safe. And it's not very practical to do what most people have to do, which is put a lock around using STL because there goes your scalability. You lock, you do some STL operations, you unlock. Well, while you're locked, no one else can do any STL functions. That's kind of crude. Uh, a lot of people do that. So some of the interfaces can't be made thread safe, like queues. STL defines an operation. Check to see if the queue is, has anything in it and it has an operation, pop something off the queue. Well, if you want to do a non-blocking pop something off the queue, um, you need to put a lock around that because if you just query to see if the queue is empty or not and then go do a pop thinking if it's not, you know, someone else may have popped it. So we added a pop if, um, if present, a non-blocking pop that can return a, hey, there wasn't anything there. Um, it's subtle things like that. So we did some um, things to help um, and we call those the concurrent containers. We've got some high performance implementations of things that are roughly like STL or we've changed some of the interfaces to work and given a high performance implementation. Queues are fun. If you've never tried to write a parallel queue, um, if you are into uh, really thinking hard and sweating bullets, uh, go ahead. Um, many, many concurrent queues have been written out there that break because thinking about the concurrency of making a highly concurrent queue is a nightmare. Um, and to really highlight it, in the 1960s, IBM added an instruction, uh, compare and swap into the um, instruction set of IBM 360, thinking it solved this problem. And then something in computer science known as the ABA problem came up and uh, proved that this instruction didn't solve the problem, but they had deployed it. Um, most microprocessors have an instruction like that, and I think if you took a poll, most people would think it solves the, the ability to, to figure out how to um, do a concurrent queue insert, um, and it doesn't solve the problem. Anyways, you can study the ABA problem sometime if you want. I just say, um, hey, concurrent queues are challenging enough to write, and the, they really should be part of something you can count on from STL or from threading building blocks. So we did that. Got a variety of other things, access to the uh, scheduler, portable, portable locks and atomic operations, 
Boost kind of does this, but you know, for most people, writing in Linux, you, you use mutexes, and writing in Windows, you use uh, uh, critical sections, and so they're, they're not portable, so you end up with if defs. Well, why on earth can't a lock be portable? Well, it can. You could use POSIX locks everywhere, but they're not evenly supported. So we said, hey, we'll, we'll create the mutexes, uh, define exactly what they do, and the atomic operations, make them part of threading building blocks. You can use them or not use them. You can still use if def critical sections and if def p, uh, p, uh, mutexes or use boost threads. Each one of these boxes is independent, can be used separate of each other. And then finally, memory allocation. A thread aware memory allocator? This is critical. This is just, you know, why is malloc not thread safe? Or why is malloc, you know, terrible? Um, it just is. Um, in most places. So um, imagine if you're allocating memory and releasing it. Well, what if I'm core number one on a processor? I allocate some memory, I release it. When the thread that's running in my core returns it with free, um, or the C++ equivalent of destruction of, of a um, container, if that memory is given to another core, it's highly likely that the actual data contents were sitting of that memory are sitting in this core's cache. And if they're dirty at all, if they've been changed, it's really evil because as soon as the other core tries to use it, that core has to wait till this core writes it back to memory. It's a delay. Much more efficient if you scoreboard and keep track of, hey, the last, uh, the last core to use this is this one. I'm going to kind of prefer hold on to it and give it back to it. Of course, you don't want to hold on it forever if you've it's a huge amount of memory, and you may reuse it. But that's one issue. The other is, ca is false sharing. If you allocate memory to multiple processors or cores that are too close together, they could be on the same cache line and cause amazing crash. So I gave a talk in the UK last summer that I, I talked about this and said it's very common for us to see 10 20% speed up when people just pop this into a parallel program, C, C or C++ program. And that is, it's very common. Someone stood up and said, I was underselling it. That when they switched to it, they got a 400% speed up. I thought, wow, you must have really been thrashing your cash. But yes, I've seen that too. Um, people don't think about the memory allocations. And I'm talking in big programs. They're doing all this memory in and out and having that for threat awareness. So this is, we believe this is a pretty complete list, a complete list based on our experience of what applications will suffer from if they try to use C, C++ for parallelism. So we hit all these areas. And solutions to a variety of these had existed in piecemeal and so forth, but this is the vision of threading building blocks. Here's a little bit of what it looks like. The bad news here is this is what, is what all the examples in my book look like. Um, it's real easy to read if you're a C++ programmer. You're going to do a parallel four, but you can't specify the code. So you take the code and you put it in a, in a struct or a class. I, I always, I'm a C programmer turned C++, so I keep thinking struct. But it doesn't matter. You can write it either way. Anyways, you've got a class up at the top, and you put code up there. This scares C programmers to death, or at least tells them, oh my gosh, what's that? And I go, well, it's just a, you're just using a template. What's a template? OK. So, um, I'm a big fan of uh, I'm a big fan of Lambda in C++. And if you haven't seen Lambdas, Lambdas are going to become popular in every language. They're already in. Um, I mean, they were in Lisp forever. Um, Microsoft put them in all the .NET languages. Now C++ is getting around to it. Uh, Apple has put something very similar into it into their compiler. Um, not not quite Lambdas, but they'll do it in the C++ um, thing. But they did something like this in C. And the reason it's going to become popular is you're going to say, here's a piece of code, run it in parallel. Well, how do you do that? Do you have to put it in a function or a class? Well, that was the problem we ran into before. But now the new C++ draft standard, and OX did turn out to be a hexadecimal number, I guess. Um, actually, I think they're going to call it 09, but um, it's not final. Um, they, you can just specify things. Um, Sorry, it's a little grayed out. But you do the parallel four, it still looks like an, uh, I guess it got grayed out a bit. But you put this funny syntax where you put an angle brackets and an equal sign, or you can put some other things, ampersands and stuff. And then you, and then you give a parameter, and it looks like a function call, except instead of the name, you have angle brackets. You, can, you don't need to put an equal or an ampersand in there. Those all have to do with whether you have access to the local 
the variables that are local in scope when you declare this. Um, but you put the angle brackets instead of the name. So uh, I guess this is an example of I don't want my name function. Um, and then you put a function there. And that creates a handle that can be passed around into templates, into routines, and so forth. And so you don't have to break it out as a separate function and name it and all that stuff. Very powerful. Someday I'll rewrite the book. We, we've been posting new versions of all the examples on our website um, using Lambda syntax. Um, I don't want, know what the GNU schedule is for supporting Lambdas. Um, I, I just don't know. It may be there. Um, Microsoft's adding it this year. We added it to our compiler a couple of years ago. So we'll increasingly see compilers that can support this. And I'm looking forward to teaching threading building blocks when that's the norm instead of making it look like C++ uh, too much with templates. All right, so there, there are a couple of comments. Um, I Sorry, uh, yeah, I'll repeat. Yeah, so, so there were a couple of comments that boil down to an observation, I think, in both that, that um, or a question, why did we do C++ um, uh, bindings, templates, and so forth, um, instead of maybe a C definition, uh, and then build C++ on top of it. And an observation that if we had done the C, you could um, bind it to other languages. And I, yes, that's, that's completely accurate. It's actually something we're looking at now. We've had a lot of requests for C bindings. Um, I would say, honestly, I don't think our team, we completely understood how much um, pain uh, the need for C bindings would create. But we're m much more aware of it now. Um, <laughs> is that polite enough? Um, the reason we went after it is we really were, did want to solve the C++ problems and not ignore STL and containers. So that was on our mind. The other thing is, is that templates is an explicit way to extend C++. C doesn't have an explicit way to um, extend C. You become an incompatible compiler or you just do function calls. There's some advantages of what we're doing by avoiding function calls. So templates expand and are much more efficient. Um, if we have to go to a real function call, which C would force us to, that's going to create some inefficiencies and we have some doubts about how, how well that will work. I'll mention later um, a project called Silk that we're doing. Um, so we're going to do two things. We're probably going to add C bindings to TBB um, because our customers are definitely asking for that. Um, we have some doubts because of that, that, that that'll turn out to be efficient enough for a lot of people because the function call overhead. Um, we have a project called Silk to add some keywords to the C language. That'll make us not compatible with other Cs, but um, we think that there will be, um, in time, compilers will want to add some keywords. Apple's already doing it. We're thinking of doing it. We're talking to Microsoft and the GNU community. Um, we may, we may take a step forward with some of them that I mentioned, or we may take a step forward and test the grounds. And um, what we, we have in mind is a compiler implementation of keywords that would be very C-oriented um, that sit on top of the TBB runtime and create calls, you know, create interaction with it, but do it in a very C manner. And that should make it easy to export the C routines and so forth. Very good observations, and yeah, where were you when we were designing this um, five years ago? <laughs> um, you know, we, OpenMP works pretty well for C programmers, and we have had some challenge at overcoming the popularity of OpenMP. Um, um, C++ programmers tend to uh, try TBB and really love it, but the adoption with C programmers has been much smaller, radically smaller. Um, so, so the, the, anyways, we've got a, we've got a bunch of uh, routines: parallel four, parallel scan, 
you don't know what a parallel scan is and you, you want to get um, into parallelism, it's kind of a fun thing to look at. Um, it's something that parallel um, implementations commonly miss, but computer scientists that are really into parallelism will say, hey, it's going to be a mistake to miss this. Um, you probably won't get any speed up on parallel scan until you get to at least four cores, but it's a, it's a way to do something in parallel that looks like it can't be done in parallel. Imagine a series of numbers where um, a, sub, a sub n equals a sub n minus 1 and some equation operating on it. In other words, each element of an array depends on what the value of the element before it was with some computation attached, doubling it, adding something, whatever. Um, that can actually be done in parallel with a multi-pass algorithm. Um, depends on exactly the equation, how efficient that is, but that's what parallel scans about. And most people look at that, um, an equation like that, and say it can't be done in parallel. It's one example of some things that can be done in parallel. Um, they're not nearly as efficient as doing it in, in sequential, um, but it scales. So who cares? This is a big part of how to do parallel programming is you have to figure out efficiency isn't the name of the game anymore. Scaling is. So if you have an algorithm that's a third as efficient but can scale onto 100 processors um, and your inefficient al or your efficient algorithm can only run on one processor, the scaling is going to win. So there's a lot of things, uh, parallel fours, four each's. There's a pipeline operation, which is um, people have been extraordinarily creative at what to do with pipelines. Um, we thought that this was a cool feature to add, and we'll see if anyone uses it. And um, for a while, um, for the first year, I'd say that uh, 40 to 50 percent of people using threading building blocks, any of these algorithms, were using pipeline, and that just astonished us. But lots of people said, oh, I figured out how to map this onto it, and people are very creative. Uh, parallel invoke for parallelism and, and parallel sort. Um, so anyways, um, yes, flattery goes a long ways. So a team started up at Microsoft implemented something into their C, C++ compiler. They'll release it in April. It's in beta now. They imitated a subset of TBB. They called it PPL for Parallel Patterns Library. And they also came to us and said, hey, there's some concurrent containers. We know you've already written code for it. Could we have that code and be completely compatible with you, which we did. Um, so they're releasing that. Um, but then they were also able to do something. They also ported it to their .NET environment. So for some people, this is really um, makes them look at TBB uh, in a different light and say, hey, this is great. Microsoft's doing something very similar, so it's safe to code in it. So I'm not going you know, <laughs> to pass a value judgment whether people should think that way, but there's a lot of people who do, and this is important. Um, but before Microsoft releases that. They still haven't released it. It's in beta. But we've gotten a lot of adoption of threading building blocks. Uh, a very popular application, uh, Autodesk Maya. Maya is just heavily used. I go to lots of customers in the entertainment segment, Hollywood, gaming, you know, entertainment arts and stuff, use Maya. Um, Maya was surprisingly not very threaded. Um, by the way, neither was uh, some other very popular programs, too, that we've worked with. But the um, uh, Maya's doing this. Actually, the Epic Unreal Engine's using TBB now a little bit. They'll use it more in the future. Um, and they're encouraging developers that do plugins to use TBB. So this is, and Maya encourages developers doing plugins to use TBB um, as their parallelism. Having a standard's really great. And these guys have gotten really good performance out of it. Um, and, and that's a 10 million line program. Well, I'll come back to that later, but it's just staggering to put parallelism into that. So let me talk a little about the open sourcing, because this is um, kind of fun. We released this as a commercial product in August of 2006. And some of us believed that we probably were going to want to open source this. But we didn't make the strong case for it in Intel, because frankly, we would have failed. Um, but we got it out in the community and started getting serious interest in it, evaluation, and said, hey, this is good. This is a good implementation. We want to use it. But there were two problems. If we use it and code it into our application as the way we do parallelism, will it work on, is it ported everywhere? And we said, well, we've got Windows, Linux, Mac OS done. We've done Intel processors and AMD. 
um, and itanium processors, and we've done, um, and we're working on a Spark port and a, and a, a PowerPC port. And people said, oh, that's lovely. That's, that's everything I need now, but what if I need something in the future? Will you sign a piece of paper that says that forever and ever, Intel will make sure that they port it to anything I ever ask them for? And, you know, our lawyers, we didn't even ask our lawyers to look at that. So we knew that was a problem. The other thing is, um, even more fascinating, I like to call it, well, what if Intel gets bored and quits producing it as a product? A very real threat, too. I mean, not that we would get bored of this, but... But it's something, if you're going to write a program that requires a piece of proprietary software to compile it, um, lots of people are, are worried about that. For some reason, a lot of people have confidence that Microsoft will support things forever. Um, but beyond Microsoft, you know, there's a lot of questions. And so we definitely had big question marks by our name. So we looked at a variety of ways to try to solve this, promised them that they could have the code, escrow it, whatever. Um, but we were all the time thinking open source is probably the answer, and that's what we did. So we open sourced it in uh, July of 2007 and um, called that 2.0. And since then, we've released a few more versions. We've gotten contributions. We have an Xbox 360 port that was done by somebody, and we were just surprised with. We've had some other ports where people have contacted us, said they wanted to work with us on them. Um, it's been a big success, both in terms of usage of it, uh, contributions to the project, um, recognition, so forth. It's been really good. Um, these are a few pictures from OzCon when I introduced it. Um, I, I got reminded because someone dug up some photos of me in a suit, which is actually a pretty rare thing unless I'm at a wedding. Um, but Dirk Handel, who I, I don't, some of you may know Dirk, um, he used to be CTO at uh, Suze a, a decade ago. It's probably a decade now, my gosh. Um, has it really been that long? Anyways, he joined us from Suze. Um, he talked me the day before into really leaving an impression at OzCon. He said, because we were worried, I only had a few minutes on stage right after Tim O'Reilly, and um, how do you leave an impression? He says, you'd leave an impression if you stood up in front on a stage in a suit and tried to sell them TBB before you announced you were open sourcing it. <laughs> yeah, it left an impression. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fortunately, they figured out it was a joke and didn't run me out on rails, but Dirk jumped up on stage and we got applause and people remembered it, but that's why I was in a suit. And I did, I did tell them that it was a bargain at $2.99 before I told them we were open sourcing it. Um, they all put their laptops down and listened. Uh, <laughs> who is this crazy guy? It's been very successful for us. Um, you know, it really... Um, <laughs> It really was a thrill convincing Intel to do this. And, you know, we, we were looking at whether our interests would be protected. And it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, when we went to select a license, we kind of had an attitude that's very similar to any of you that contribute to open source projects or me. When I do something, it's become common in the open source community. One of the things you don't want to happen is that you work really hard on it, you contribute it, and someone off, off, takes it off in a corner does a few adjustments on it, starts making a bunch of money off of it, um, and won't share what they did. Well, you know, that's, that's the essence behind GPL licenses. Uh, in one, one um, thing it solves um, is to make sure that a contribution to the community stays the community, and that if you want to play in the community, you contribute and share. Um, you know what? We're okay with that at Intel. It was kind of interesting. We settled on the GPL license for this because we have the same headache. We, we put a lot of work into it. We're ready to share it. We were not too thrilled with the idea of a competitor taking it, um, turning it for their own uh, desires, and hiding it, taking it proprietary. So um, that's why we went with the GPL license. And I found it kind of interesting that as we d examine what are we afraid of, we're afraid of the same things individuals are afraid of, about putting the effort and the IP into it. And um, we're willing to share it, but we're not willing to have someone take it and make it their own. No, so, so we actually, we went with a dual license, like MySQL. So Intel still holds the copyright to the code. And I know with some of the community this is controversial, and some of the community it's like, yeah, of course, you know, that's a good thing to do. Um, but because of that, we were able to share with Microsoft. That was one of our motivations of doing it. The other motivation is we make the binary available non-GPL. And there are a non-trivial number of companies out there that will not touch something GPL. Now, we have we released it under GPL v2 
V2 was current at the time we released this. V3 didn't exist. GPL V2 with class path exception. It's the same lot. It's the same license that's used for the C++ STL library um, with GNU. Class path exception, by the way, is the C answer, C++ answer to how do you prevent from being um, viral um, your license uh, when you use it. Um, it's the same as LGPL is to C. LGPL is the, the library license that says if you link with it, you're not polluted. Unfortunately, C++, you actually include the source code into your program and compile it, so it needed a different license. But what we're doing is exactly what the GNU C++ library does. But yeah, we did the dual license because um, some people in the world feel um, are scared of GPL. And um, you know, I can't render legal opinions for them. There's very little case law right now. There have been very few lawsuits around GPL. And lawyers in general will say, if it hasn't been tested in courts around the world, be nervous. So um, in any case, um, the dual license solved that. My SQL has become extremely popular in the world because they did it. And the database is, is people feel confident they can use MySQL in commercial situations because they buy the, they pay some money that helps with the development of MySQL. So we, uh, we make the uh, non-GPL library binary available. But if you want the source code, it's, uh, you, you go with the GPL. Our GPL and our non-GPL are identical. Same source code, no changes. The only thing we do is the license. And uh, they're maintained at the same, actually the open source version is always released a few weeks earlier. Question? So I can't, um, I can't comment on the legal agreements between us and, and Microsoft, but what I can say is um, the decision boiled down to this. We're promoting um, TBB in the open source community as a parallel solution for C++. Um, we're very adamant about driving that, helping it, supporting it. We put more people on the project after we open sourced it than we had before, which is critical um, success. And Microsoft came along and said, hey, we'd like to do exactly what you're doing, but we, you know, uh, if, if, we implement it, if, we, if we implemented it ourselves, it might be a little different. Do you want to give us the code? So at that moment, we had to decide. If we said no, we were probably driving Microsoft to be incompatible. We had the opportunity to make them compatible from the start. Um, I think they'll stay compatible. I think it's in their best interest. And I can't describe whether we put anything legal in place. But um, it was a relatively easy decision for us because we had the opportunity to keep them compatible with the open source, and we jumped at it. Um, do I feel thrilled out of my mind about that? Well, I'm OK with it. <laughs> um, I would have rather they just adopted the open source project, but that wasn't going to happen. Okay, so um, the question was, uh, our team's an engineering team in an engineering company, uh, a for-profit company. Um, how do we, how do we uh, market inside Intel that we should be allowed to continue working on something that we're giving away? Excellent question. <laughs> um, well, there's a, there's a strong belief in Intel that this move to multi-core is a big challenge um, in the software community. And I think that uh, we're well recognized inside the company as experts at this, and we talk about the barriers to that. And we look at it and say, well, what can we do to lower the barriers, increase the likelihood that um, people write software that can use what we can build? And that's where it derives from. And so threading building blocks, um, the way the pivotal thing at Intel to convince us to open source it was if we open source this, we'll get more adoption of it. And I work for a company that, hey, getting adoption of the software is in our best interest and we aren't looking to make money off of it. So we're kind of in a great position. We do an, a lot at Intel to support and promote open source. I think we've been the most aggressive at releasing graphics drivers open source. Um, 
in the, in the community. We've contributed the Linux kernel. And in my team, we're, we're seeing that the ability to do parallelism and drive that, um, that open source is a great approach. In fact, if we knew now, if we knew then what we know now, uh, we should have open sourced our OpenMP implementation uh, for the GNU community. Um, by the time GNU was working on OpenMP and we would have thought to do that, uh, it was a little too late, and that's unfortunate. And hopefully in the future we, uh, we recognize that a little more quickly. Um, you know, we are. We're a, a company that's making money, and we tend to treat things proprietary, and doing things open source takes uh, a little extra effort. And we're getting, we're getting there, though. We're understanding the, uh, the extreme power of that. Um, and it's very altruistic, too. We really can just say, hey, uh, we don't it, use it for parallelism. Yes, not all of it will run on our hardware, but uh, we call it float all boats, um, the phrase in Intel. It's, uh, we give it away, and it might be used for everything, but that's good. Right, question is what's available, standard, uh, the documents about the APIs and so forth. Well, the whole thing is open source, but they're, um, and it's available at threadingbuildingblocks.org, or I think there's an alias called opentbb.org. Um, there are specifications and so forth there. And then the second part of your question was um, are we doing anything about standardization? We've taken a few of the things that we think are really key to this, and we've recommended them to the C community. Um, they, I think some of them came out in a technical report, which is, I can't describe adequately what use a technical report is in C++. It's not in the draft standard. Um, I think what it means is it's been published for review and feedback, and it might make it to a draft standard someday in the future, but it's definitely not in 0x, any parts of this. But we think it has a place there eventually. Okay, so there's a comment that some countries mandate implementations of the t TRs, technical reports. Okay, I didn't know that, but if it's true, then it's probably someone thinks they've mandated it being implemented, some parts of it. Um, given that it's open source and everybody should just grab the open source version and use it, uh, it's not too hard to implement. <laughs> Yeah, so the question, there's a question about whether or, or whether I see a future or it, how, what type of future I see at avoiding the Van, Von Neumann uh, bottlenecks by um, using different programming approaches and such. And why don't I, I'm going to touch on um, some ideas in that in the future, and I'll, get, I'll come back to that. Oh. So, so, sorry for the interruption. It's uh, 12. We have several until <laughs> quarter past 12. It's fantastic to have this dynamic. I, pretty much I tell you, I don't know how much do you want to tell. I will, I will finish at No, 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 it's after. not about that. Be warned that these guys will keep asking questions. So uh, yes. it's uh, what I am. I'm not sure if we have a, a lunch service with Francois that we can bring here to stay <laughs> until half past one. It's all included. So uh, that's a point. There is a lunch. Yeah. Lunch is coming late, so or you just have All fun, right. and you too, guys. So just wanted to. <laughs> All right. So let me let me take this question, and then I, I'm going to uh, I'll I'll wrap through the last thoughts I had. What? Yeah, excellent. Same, same sort of thing as the von Neumann question. The question's more about um, are we just fooling ourselves? I'm paraphrasing for you, but are we just fooling ourselves by continuing this share everything model and programming, and uh, shouldn't we just move to a share nothing model and, and force you to declare everything you're sharing? Absolutely, completely agree that that's what we should do. Um, it's completely impractical. So if you, if you look at 
how much software there is in the world already and adding parallelism to it, it comes back to three big barriers. One is legacy. There's a lot of software, so how do you move it? Another is education. Most people don't know much about parallel programming, haven't enough experience with it for it to be intuitive to get it right the first time. Um, um, even the experts I know usually don't get it right when they try it the first time, right? I mean, how many of us, even things we feel comfortable about, don't just you know, put a prototype together, learn from it, and change? Well, imagine when you don't know what you're doing, how many prototypes you need. Um, and then finally, tools. The tools just aren't there. So there's, um, let me go through a little, just a few more thoughts that I have in my presentation um, that I think will give a framework for this. And I come back and answer a little bit. And then um, I'm glad there's enthusiasm for this, so I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we're going to have a great um, panel discussion where the audience gets to ask even more later today. Um, so let me, let me go through. So a um, couple things. I already touched on the license. We picked uh, GPLv2 class path exception. We went with a dual license. Um, one thing that was an interesting discussion is do we open source the code or do we try to push an open API? And it's pretty easy to say, well, do both. And that's what we did with threading building blocks. But I'm not, not sure that's the best answer all the time. I think it may be better to get an API like OpenMP and drive it into uh, multiple compilers. Um, because if you don't do that, you run the risk that everyone uh, will never adopt it. Um, and so there's, there's some things here. But let me, let me say, um, you know, what we'd like is a programming model that can survive the future. And I described some possible processors before that may have big cores and little cores and lots of fancy things like that. So where do you get a programming model? And I've realized people are looking for what's the right programming language to use or what's the light, right programming model. And I realized as someone with some background in this area, uh, when people ask me, should I use, um, Rapid Mind for data parallelism, or should I use TBB? I realize, ooh, they don't understand something. That is, that you probably want to use two or three models of parallelism in your program at a time when you really get it working. And so I've developed this three tier model that I'm still refining, but data parallelism is a very fundamental thing, and it's beautiful what you can do with it, and I can't fully describe all its wonders um, this morning. But there's data parallelism at the instruction level, things like SIMD instructions like this, SSE and MMX instructions. There's data parallelism at the hardware level with multiple cores. Um, writing a program that takes advantage of both at the same time is hard because you usually do an innermost loop, use the SIMD instruction, and the loop outside that to spread it across cores. Why? Well, because that's the best languages we have today. That needs to get fixed. Data parallelism is a fundamental thing that should just be specified by a programmer as, hey, here's what I want to do, and have something translate that into the hardware. Um, but then task parallelism, which is what um, often gets think of, you want good support for that as well. And, and threading building blocks, you can write data parallelism and task parallelism and, and, and uh, actor agent sort of things in TBB. But if you had to pick one, it's generally a, a promoting a task model. And, um, so it leaves some opportunities, but you can combine these. You could have tasks controlling multiple data parallelism. You could put it together in a pipeline. Um, and the next thing you know, you've got all these different models that you're using. And should we be looking for a solution that does all of these? Or should we start to recognize that sometimes we are doing data parallelism, very highly, tightly coupled data work? A little, sometimes we're doing tasks parallelism, but sharing memory. And sometimes we're doing more of a coordination effort and doing message passing. And in this top one, usually you have a shared nothing model. And so I think the future is, is that you use all three of these in a program. Now, how do we teach that? How do we think about it? Um, a little bit more challenging. But if we look today, there's so many things being proposed for parallelism. I think it can clarify in your mind um, what, how to classify these if you think very simply that they fit in one of these three categories. So things like MPI, Erlang, the pipelines and threading building blocks sort of, although they're sharing there, but you can, if you don't, you don't have to do sharing. Microsoft's Axum, which is a, a project that they put out there, actors, agents sort of thing. Um, Linda could go here, My, Intel's uh, connected components. Uh, there's a lot of coordination sort of things being floated out there. 
And when you read about them, they may be very confusing. Like, why on earth is someone thinking about this? They're thinking about the shared nothing environment and trying to propose something. Then at the task level, you've got threading building blocks, Silk Arts is uh, C++, or Silk++, which you know, we acquired this company and we're going to put it in our compilers, and Microsoft's um, flattery of the same thing. Um, and then data parallelism, you have RapidMind. Oh, yeah, we bought them, too, last summer. That was a lot of fun. And in fact, that's where I was just before I came to New Zealand. I was up in Toronto with the, the RapidMind team, combining with CT technology, uh, Fortran 90 arrays, IPP. Um, I, uh, and, and I left CUDA off of here. Even though CUDA and OpenCL kind of fit here, I, they don't feel that they've abstracted from the hardware enough for me to list them on the same slide. But they're going after the data parallelism, so that's why they exist. Um, so if you think about this, perhaps we can think about programming models in three categories. One is the share nothing message passing coordination. Another is task parallelism. Another is data parallelism. And if you start thinking that way, wow, you can really drive some really cool things. There's things we can do in CT RapidMind because we're not trying to solve task parallelism that are beautiful, and we'll make them work with TBB, which is more at a task level. Um, and these specializations in these three areas, I think, are going to strengthen rather than blur uh, when we really get the programming right. Okay. So, so the comment is. Perhaps there's a fourth level, which is it's not even the same machine you're distributing. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, this coordination shared nothing model um, fits that. Um, however, you know, if you're using MPI on a supercomputer, you're shooting messages back pretty good bandwidth. You're closely coupled. Um, you're shooting a message from uh, New Zealand to Australia to be have a little data processed on somebody's machine in Sydney. It's a little different than sitting in the same cabinet. And I don't know. It's a really good point. I don't know if models, they perhaps they will specialize. Uh, they, they do today. So will we, will we think of them? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point that perhaps the, on top, this shared nothing, maybe it needs to be thought of in two ways. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, let me hold Grand Central. There's a question about Grand Central Dispatch, and I'll talk about that at the end. In fact, I've been, we've been talking to the Grand Central Dispatch team about whether TBB can fit into their world or how it fits into their world. We, we support it on Mac. Um, let me let me hold that to the end. I wanted to to make sure that uh, in my allotted time, which I have a couple minutes, that I leave you with um, just a couple more thoughts before I take questions. Um, let's see. So we're doing a bunch of cool things here. Um, I'll post these slides. I'll find out where to post them to, and they'll be available to you later today. Um, I wanted to say I really think that open source can be pivotal to parallel programming. I think the the need to do parallel programming today is there, the desire to do it, but for um, it to be deployed and used a lot, um, there's the standardization, availability, porting, so forth issue that, that holds over things. And having the experience of OpenMP taking more than a decade for it to be adopted enough that people f could feel confident of it because it was a had to be implemented in compiler after compiler and not every company jumped on the boat as fast, and even GNU. Um, Open sourcing is a very real option to driving this sort of adoption. Of course, the challenge, is, one of the challenges is we'll open source so many different solutions you can't figure out which one's the right one. But um, I think it's very pivotal. Um, and threading building blocks has been very successful. Um, there's an analyst report by Evans Data that follows the industry that says that threading building blocks is the most popular in terms of deployment and usage abstraction in the C++ community for parallelism. And they did some surveys and found what people were using. And that uh, really caught us. I think it was about 4% of the community said they were using it versus 3% OpenMP, just to give you a calibration. But it beat out OpenMP, which had been around for a decade, showed the power to us of, of the success we were having by open sourcing. Um, how can we, though, but how can we, 
help open source drive this and own this before it becomes proprietary. Because I think there is a danger that so, uh, proprietary solutions will pop up that interfere with the adoption of parallelism. And, you know, at Intel, I'd rather see parallelism adopted than see any barriers in the way. So I'm, you know, kind of self-serving here. But I think there's an alignment between what uh, we'd like to see from Intel, which is a lot of adoption, and what the open source community can do. Threading building blocks is an example of a success there. I'd like to see more energy in the open source community. So um, I, we are doing some projects like Silk and CT, and they are proprietary right now. But trust me, we are looking at can we get the first implementation put together, get feedback like we did with TBB, and then figure out how to introduce that in the open source community um, strongly. And we will, we will follow up on that within the next year. Those things will go open in one way or another. I'm, I'm confident. We haven't made that decision yet. Um, but the success of TBB, I think, will drive us to that. So that was, that was my... Um, that was my overview of TBB and, and so forth, and uh, I've forgotten there was a question. What's the but one? Before, before yeah. that, let me, let me do a little bit of marketing bullshit, which is <laughs> you won't be a member of a corporation if you don't bring some presence for the audience. Uh, oh, don't someone, do No? No. <laughs> that's, Why? For because that's only for Windows. Oh, cool. <laughs> Then I have a few dozens of this, which is something that you will explain better. Uh, the CDs, the CDs have, they're kind of cool to pop in and find out more about what we're doing, but they're um, uh, very quickly after you click on things, they point to places on the web. So it's kind of a neat navigation thing, but if you go to our website and look, you'll, you can find the same things. This would be sort of a reminder to do that. And, uh, well, I'm a technology entrepreneur, so I try to build an ecosystem around multi-core parallelization, but if you are curious enough, it's enough for you to find what the hell I'm doing or what. But as a benevolent dictator of this day or mini conf, I've been given three books to distribute to whoever I believe. Guys. Oh, you, you have more. He, he somehow <laughs> I, I, he some talked to some other folks at Intel and found out that we had a few of my books laying around, and he talked them out of them. So, um. so um, first of all, I would love to thank all of you to, for being here. So it has been wildly successful, more than uh, – I'm definitely not interested to become an event manager or organizer or whatever, but that has been a, a very good thing. And thank you, James, for being here. And uh, the only thing that I need to say now is that it's all yours. All right. I'm going out for lunch. <laughs> so. Thank you. I'll, I'll so tell you what. Go we, ahead. We do, well, I'll tell you what. We do need to go to lunch. So what I'm going to do is I'll stick around, but um, I don't want to hold you here. So run off to lunch. We have... Uh, Oh, I'll, I'll talk about Grand Central first thing then. Um, we do have the, uh, I talk about teaching later, and we have the panel and such. It'll be a great chance to get back together and, and, and ask a lot of questions about anything that's on your mind after, well after lunch. So uh, go ahead and do that, and uh, after there's a little bit of noise, I'll, I'll stick around. If people want to stick around and talk, that's great. I'll, and I'll answer the Grand Central dispatch question first. So. And please Thank come you. back later, because he's not the only star speaking this afternoon. <laughs> so, and... Yes, Assuming that you are a star, whatever. <laughs> it's 1.30, half past 1, 13, 30, whatever language we want. We start at half past 1, and we go until uh, uh, quarter past 3, and then we just have half an hour for afternoon tea. The, and then uh, James will be back at 16.25. <laughs> There are a lot of interesting Lots of great talks before that. Before though, so. that. All right. And, well. uh, and the panel and the birth of a feather, it's something that I strongly encourage you to come here. Thank you very much, guys. Mm -hmm.